session this morning, and I'm so happy to have the great honor to be sitting down with Estonian Foreign Minister Eva Maria Limetz. Uh, she is a career Foreign Service professional who has served both in Washington and in New York. And prior to becoming Foreign Minister, she was the Estonian Ambassador to the Czech Republic, um, with credentials also to Slovenia and Croatia. Um, Foreign Minister, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited uh, to have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, we have, unfortunately, I think, so much to discuss. Um, obviously, as we sit here this morning, we know that there are still 100,000 Russian forces, or actually, I think the number President Biden gave last night, 150,000 Russian troops on Ukraine's border. Um, so we know that the Russian military is still postured for an invasion should President Putin decide so. Um, at the same time, though, we had a couple of hints um, at de-escalation. Um, we, you know, heard um, in the meeting with, um, between Putin and Schultz, some signs that Putin is ready to de-escalate, potentially remove forces from Ukraine's border, and kind of he reiterated his commitment to diplomacy. Um, I know there's a, you know, a lot of reason that we should be skeptical about taking his statements at face value. Reasons, you know, and of course we've heard today from NATO Secretary, um, Je Secretary General Stoltenberg that there are no signs yet that those Russian forces are moving away from the border. But I want to kind of ask you where you think we are in the arc of this crisis. Um, kind of what's your assessment of what's happening um, and I think what, what Putin wants. Uh, thank you for first, uh, of course, for having me here today. Good morning, everyone. And um, and uh, uh, I very much agree that um, uh, it is very difficult security situation at the moment uh, that we face in Europe. Uh, we follow these developments uh, with great concern. And of course, we have to recall that war in um, in Europe uh, started already more than eight years ago, when uh, uh, Russia's annexation of uh, part of Ukraine took place. And at the same time, also, we saw military exercises uh, last uh, spring. And we also saw that uh, some of the military equipment was uh, left behind. And now, of course, when a new military buildup started in um, uh, late autumn, we have uh, seen um, a really heavy military buildup of, of uh, uh, military forces uh, uh, next to the Ukrainian border. And of course, um, as the amount of uh, military uh, personnel and equipment is massive at the borders of Ukraine, at the moment we cannot uh, talk about the uh, de-escalation. It definitely takes uh, quite some time to see some um, uh, de-escalation. But of course, uh, uh, if these uh, political signs and readiness of, of de-escalation are true, then from our side we, of course, welcome it because uh, I think that we must do everything possible to avoid another war in Europe. Uh, you also posed the question what uh, President yeah. uh, Putin uh, wants. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's my assess assessment. It's, it's difficult to be sure in, uh, in it. But uh, what we have seen, unfortunately, we have seen his second dream uh, uh, towards a Ukrainian uh, prosperous and democratic Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it seems that um, uh, Russia uh, does not want to have uh, uh, democratic and prosperous countries around his uh, borders. And of course, also we have uh, seen that uh, they would like to uh, reestablish uh, the time of uh, buffer zones around its borders. And uh, from our perspective, it is uh, unacceptable uh, to have other wave of negotiations or start negotiations about the European um, security inf infrastructure because we have legal framework in place and we should uh, fulfill the um, uh, current commitments. Yeah. So I mean, as, uh, being a kind of frontline state you know, right next door to Russia, I mean, Estonia has kind of consistently warned about the prospects for Russian aggression. Are you in any way surprised by what you're seeing now um, by this military buildup around Ukraine? Unfortunately, I have to admit that I am uh, not uh, surprised what I've seen over the last uh, year and even longer because, as I said, uh, this war uh, started already eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we have to recall also 2008 when uh, there was a war against uh, Georgia's independent, um, uh, another independent country neighboring uh, 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 Russia. Uh, therefore, it is very important to, to uh, really have this um, uh, a dialogue with the Russian Federation so that there are no additional attempts to, to aggressively um, attack other neighboring countries. 
So one of the things we've seen, you know, with Putin's aggressive actions, it spurs a reaction from the West. And one of the things, you know, that we've all taken note of is how it's changed discourse, for example, in places like Sweden and Finland, who, where kind of this Russian actions have revitalized their conversations about the potential for NATO uh, membership. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this current escalation um, and really the sustained aggression against Ukraine has shaped the discourse in Estonia, both kind of in government, but also in the public? How is this being talked about? Uh, there are many aspects, of course, related to this uh, current crisis. Uh, first, of course, um, uh, as Estonia is a NATO member since 2004, uh, we are confident that the uh, uh, current security situation and concerns about the uh, security situation in uh, Europe uh, do not uh, pose direct threat to Estonia because uh, we are member states of, of NATO mm -hmm. and this is very important for, uh, for us and for our society. At the same time, of course, we follow with uh, great concern these developments and we have also um, uh, a relatively big Russian-speaking society in Estonia and we have uh, many um, uh, migrant workers from Ukraine in Estonia, which means that uh, this debate is there in Estonia because everyone really um, uh, is worried about these uh, developments. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, at the same time, we also think how we could better support Ukraine in this difficult mm -hmm. situation. And we have made many announcements. We have uh, provided economic support. We have also uh, provided um, uh, military equipment uh, support, but also, of course, the political support, and this is the most important one. And uh, by saying this, I also would like to underline this united approach that we have uh, seen among our European partners, but also among NATO allies in uh, support of, of Ukraine and also its uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. Yeah, I wanted, that's definitely one of the things I wanted to ask you about is kind of your sense of where allies are. I agree with you. I think the kind of extent of coordination and cohesion among allies has been really remarkable. And if you think back to when um, the United States first started warning about this, about this unusual Russian military activity on Ukraine's border back in October, I think the United States, but certainly European countries, had very different views of what was happening. We certainly didn't have a common threat picture. And since then, through all of this coordination, we've built that threat picture, talked about potential um, responses. But there have been some bumps in the road, right? And so there have been some, some people have been concerned about some of the signs coming from Berlin, in particular, unwillingness to provide lethal or to provide military aid for Ukraine, uh, kind of an unwillingness early on to talk about Nord Stream 2 and whether that would be at risk if Russia escalates. Uh, you've also had some kind of, the, you know, French President Emmanuel Macron has pursued his path of diplomacy with Putin. Can you talk to me about what that what the view looks like from Estonia um, and your sense of um, unity within the alliance? I would say that we have really seen a great unity among uh, allies. And uh, uh, here I would like, uh, first I would like to recall some of the joint statements that we have uh, uh, made. Uh, first, of course, uh, is the um, uh, conclusion of uh, last NATO summit in June, where uh, allied countries agreed that uh, Russia is a threat for European security and uh, NATO allies. And I think uh, based on this um, uh, conclusion, also the developments uh, uh, and uh, other activities within NATO have shown that we are uh, very much united um, among our allies. Uh, and uh, it's the same uh, within the uh, European Union. Here I would like to recall uh, the conclusions of the uh, last um, uh, European Council, which took place uh, in December, where leaders of uh, the European Union agreed on uh, posing sanctions if uh, uh, there is um, uh, escalation posed by Russia. Uh, it shows that there is a close coordination uh, between the United States and the European countries and uh, we are very much on the same place uh, on, on this. And um, here, uh, let me throw another example. Also, Chancellor uh, Scholz was here in, in Washington, D.C. And, and I think that in the, at least based on the uh, press uh, conference, I think they were, they were very much on the same uh, place, for example, in terms of uh, pu uh, putting forward sanctions if, if there is escalation. And also, we, uh, we have had this united front among uh, like-minded countries in, in other formats as well.
Yeah, so do you, do you think if Russia invades militarily um, that, there, that we would see coordination on sanctions? Are we there? Um, yes, uh, I, I believe that uh, we are there. Uh, of course, uh, there, is, uh, some, there are some agreements that need to be uh, made between uh, our uh, countries, but uh, from the EU side, um, uh, our leaders are ready to uh, uh, meet immediately uh, if the situation uh, requires and, and uh, then go forward with, with um, uh, strong sanctions. The, the other um, kind of area that has drawn a lot of discussion and debate is um, about what happens uh, with Russian actions that are short of a major military incursion. So if we do see things more in the gray zone, in the cyber domain, other Russian attempts that fall short of, you know, crossing the border into Ukraine, you know, President Biden used the term a minor incursion. Um, do, what is, do, you know, what is your sense of how allies are prepared to respond to those kind of less um, overt scenarios of Russian aggression. And do you share that opinion that it will be harder to maintain cohesion um, in, in that kind of scenario? It is, of course, difficult to um, uh, predict all the possible ways how, how Russia plans to uh, attack uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, but of course, if there is a military, another military attack, then definitely we have to, we have to um, uh, act uh, decisively, uh, and also as we have discussed it publicly, by opposing also uh, heavy sanctions. Uh, when there are other type of um, uh, activities uh, against the sovereign Ukraine, uh, then uh, there I think that it is very important to continue um, uh, with political support uh, to Ukraine. And also we must continue to help uh, raise resilience of, of Ukrainian authorities in terms of uh, their cyber security or um, also uh, fight um, uh, with um, uh, disinformation, mm -hmm. which is another very important topic at the moment. So um, uh, I think that we should strengthen programs that we have uh, currently in place with Ukraine and support, uh, raise the resilience in these other areas so that they could, um, uh, so that they could uh, push back all the different uh, pressure from, from Russia. Yeah, another issue that's gotten some attention certainly in the Western media is the Biden administration's willingness to kind of share intelligence and to declassify information in an effort you know, maybe in part to help shape the global narrative, um, but in many ways, I think also to try to disrupt Russian planning and, you know, make it more difficult for Putin to do what Putin does. Um, you know, do you see a, a change in the administration's posture in terms of information sharing? And do you think that strategy has been effective in disrupting Russian plans? I think that uh, currently what we have seen is uh, really very different that we have seen uh, previously. We have seen that all the intelligence information is published and we really uh, know what, uh, what's uh, going on and it also helps us to better prepare for, uh, uh, for um, uh, different scenarios. I think this is um, a good uh, uh, strategy mm, and uh, uh, it would put also Russia in more difficult uh, situation in, in attacking uh, its uh, neighbors. And uh, also it has um, uh, helped to, to uh, uh, create this united front among allies because everyone has uh, the same information uh, and it's uh, easier to argue why do we need this or another um, approach uh, in this uh, situation. So I think it is uh, um, uh, very good, and uh, I truly hope that the United States uh, continues its, its leadership uh, also uh, in, uh, in current, um, uh, that we have seen uh, so far. So we very much hope that th this will uh, continue. Yeah, it seems like it has been a real factor in, tr in, in so that we all see the threat assessment the same way. I agree. Um, I want to ask you, too, about kind of some domestic Russian dynamics. And, you know, you hear sometimes um, that Putin is very isolated and that certainly raises the risk that he could miscalculate. Um, we've seen, for example, too, that there's been some groups inside Russia who have written public letters urging President Putin not to um, escalate militarily in Ukraine. Um, how do you think the Russian public would respond if Putin escalates? And do you think there's any risk that this could kind of in any way 
um, cause domestic turmoil inside Russia? Uh, it is very difficult to assess uh, uh, this situation in Russia uh, also because uh, what we have seen over the years, uh, we have seen um, uh, Russia closing uh, think tanks. We have, uh, we have seen that the, uh, the law about foreign agents is, um, is something that uh, is used to um, uh, undermine um, uh, freedom of expression. Um, we have seen um, a lot of political prisoners, unfortunately. So uh, uh, it clearly shows that um, uh, civil society is under a severe pressure. So they are, uh, it's difficult for them objectively yeah. express their real thoughts. And another thing what we have seen over the last uh, few um, uh, years is, of course, massive disinformation about the um, uh, situation or also about the security situation. Um, uh, recently, I, I saw the um, uh, bolls of, of uh, Levadia, which is one of the independent poll stations in, 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 uh, in Russia. And um, these polls clearly show that the uh, majority of, of Russians uh, uh, believe that uh, mm -hmm. this war is not uh, created by, by Russia if it's created, uh, but uh, by, by uh, 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 Western countries and by NATO uh, particularly. And only 4% uh, uh, disagreed with this view. So it clearly shows that, um, uh, the, that people in Russia live under very different uh, information uh, than we do. Right. OK, so I'm kind of swinging back and forth a little bit. But so we talked a little bit about kind of the united response that you would expect if there was a military incursion, kind of how we're thinking about how to respond at lower levels of kind of hybrid attacks. Um, but assuming we do follow this diplomatic path now, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what that would mean for Estonia. So I would imagine if we do follow this diplomatic path that we could see you know, renewed dialogue and negotiations between the United States on Russia on things on arms control issues and other risk reduction measure, measures. Um, what interests and what concerns um, do, would, would Estonia want the United States to take into account um, in any negotiations with Russia. I mean, we know, we know that Europeans, you know, don't want the United States negotiating certainly anything over the Europeans' heads and negotiating without the Europeans about things um, that directly um, affect European security. But, you know, I, you know, talk to me a little bit about how you see that diplomatic path kind of unfolding and what you would want the United States to understand about Estonian interests in any future negotiations on European security. Uh, from our perspective, you really uh, underlined very important uh, elements for us, uh, particularly that nothing uh, can be negotiated over our heads or over the heads of Ukraine, for example. And uh, therefore, we also are satisfied with the current formats of dialogue. Of course, the US and, and uh, Russia have their uh, dialogue format on the issues which are really uh, between uh, of uh, these two countries. But we have also NATO-Russia Council uh, format for uh, dialogue with, with uh, Russia. And of course, another format is within the OSCE. Uh, for us, it is uh, very important that we uh, stick to the uh, uh, main principles of the European security architecture, uh, that countries uh, must uh, respect the uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of all the uh, member states. Mm -hmm. And every country has its own right to choose its uh, security policy current choice. And of course, as a NATO country, for us, of course, it is important that all the decisions that we make within NATO are the decisions of NATO countries. No other third country can say what NATO decides or will not decide. Yeah. So these are very important uh, elements for us. And uh, kind of continuing down this path, if we were to see de-escalation, I mean, there could be the temptation for some people to kind of, poof, we dodged a bullet, and now you know maybe there's a concern that the United States just goes back to its business of focusing on China. Um, I think that's misguided. I would assume that you would share that view also. But so. I, mean, I guess I think I've been thinking, no matter what happens, this is a really strong signal that Putin has no interest in the stable and predictable relationship that the Biden administration has wanted to establish. And so can you talk to me a little bit about what this signals to you? Do you, know, do you sense that this is, in some ways, I don't want to use turning point, 
uh, in U.S. Russia relations or Europe Europe's relations with Russia. But you know, what does this tell you about where the Putin regime is and their approach to foreign policy? Do you think this is the beginning of an even more brazen and aggressive Russia? Is you know, how do we think about what is likely to come, even if we don't see an invasion? Uh, first, I think that uh, the, uh, I would like to say that the uh, uh, current security crisis in Europe has clearly shown uh, that the United States uh, has a very important uh, balancing power in terms of uh, European security situation. And, uh, and um, uh, it is very important that uh, the United States uh, continues to uh, be part of this uh, and uh, continues to be actual member of, of, uh, of NATO. And, um, and uh, from our perspective, it is uh, very important that we have seen this leader, leadership uh, by the United States. Uh, and uh, we really hope that uh, this uh, continues also. Uh, when we uh, speak about the, the uh, um, near future or even uh, long-term future, um, then, uh, of course, we can we must continue to uh, uh, be vigilant and, and uh, continue to follow the developments uh, because um, uh, what we have seen at the moment, we have uh, seen the military build up of uh, about 150,000 yeah. troops um, next to the borders of, of Ukraine. Uh, we have seen also uh, military exercises, uh, Zapad, uh, taking place uh, last autumn. So we have seen this uh, constant uh, military pressure from Russia's side towards its uh, Western neighbors. It, it clear, clearly shows that uh, this instability, what is created uh, mm -hmm. in Europe at the moment, continues for quite uh, some time. And uh, it is very important to uh, continue with uh, diplomatic efforts, uh, mm -hmm. especially by, by the leaders of, of uh, transatlantic uh, community. Uh, trying to, to uh, solve this political crisis uh, and, and uh, really help to create peace and security in our uh, part of the world. One issue that hasn't received uh, nearly as much of attention, obviously, as Ukraine is Belarus. And, you know, we have the joint exercises there. We've got Russian troops there, I think, for the first time really in history, the, up to 60,000 forces during the time that they're holding these joint exercises uh, with Russia. Um, also kind of dialogue in uh, Belarus suggesting that they could change the constitution to allow Belarus to host Russian nuclear weapons. Um, so what's your sense of, and I, I recognize that Putin and I think Lukashenko also um, has said that those Russian forces will depart at the end of exercises. But again, you know, how credible is that? Um, and, and what are your thoughts and concerns about Russia's kind of uh, continuing erosion of Belarusian autonomy and what that means for Estonia? Uh, uh, you, you put many questions yes, uh, I did. together, I'm sorry. so I try to reflect uh, <laughs> yeah. us, uh, all of them. Yeah. Uh, first, of course, uh, uh, I would like to uh, um, uh, emphasize that uh, these military exercises in, uh, in Belarus, uh, uh, that is, uh, carried, which are carried out, to, uh, carried out together with, with uh, uh, the Russian Federation, uh, another uh, clear sign of, of violation of uh, international law. And uh, Estonia, together with the other Baltic neighbors, we also made um, an uncomplaint um, um, uh, in uh, OSCE because it is violation of, of uh, uh, the uh, norms of the uh, Vienna document. Um, and uh, so therefore, it also shows that uh, we are worried about these um, uh, developments and it clearly uh, changes the um, uh, balance of, of, of uh, uh, military powers in Europe if uh, this kind of exercises uh, take place and also if uh, there are uh, new military bases uh, created in, in, uh, in, in Belarus. Um, these kind of developments are a great concern for us. And of course, um, if this uh, security situation changes in, in our neighborhood, then we also have to make another assessment of the uh, security situation in NATO and, and uh, also um, uh, adjust our defense and uh, deterrence uh, posture. So we follow all these developments with great concern and, and, uh, and I think that we have to continue to discuss it uh, uh, within NATO as well. 
uh, at the same time, uh, when we see uh, these um, developments in, in Belarus, especially the de developments uh, that started after the um, stolen elections in, in August uh, 2020, uh, uh, we have seen um, uh, severe undermining of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And we, as a, um, not exactly neighboring countries, but still a country from the region, uh, follow all these uh, developments with uh, great concern uh, because um, Belarus has been a country which has also uh, looked to, towards uh, demo democracy and uh, towards um, uh, Western countries. And of course, it would have been nice to see another uh, democratic country in our region. Unfortunately, uh, this trend is uh, reversed at the moment. And, uh, but I, I truly hope that uh, Belarus continues uh, as a sovereign and independent country in our region. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a continuation of the same questions. Kind of if you look at what's happening in the region with Russia, so it's obviously they're using military force to threaten and intimidate Ukraine. There's been this really, I think, remarkable erosion of Belarusian autonomy um, in the last, like, as you said, since 2020 in their stolen election. Um, there was also Russia's intervention in Kazakhstan to shore up an embattled dictator there. Um, and again, I know we, we can't get into Putin's mind, but there is a narrative in the West that, you know, Putin is cornered, that he's been backed in, that he's already lost. And I see, you know, certainly there are reasons to say that, you know, they are becoming more dependent on, chi on China. The NATO alliance is more united and focused uh, than ever. Um, so there's real reasons to understand that, you know, that, that, that what Russia has done has created real costs, isolated Russia. But I wonder what the picture of the world is that Putin sees. And so if he's looking, you know, that he now has increased influence in Belarus, he's able to kind of use his military tool to ratchet up and ratchet down to apply pressure on Ukraine. He's, I think, used Kazakhstan really to expand or reverse a decline in Russian influence in Central Asia um, because he's now the go-to guy for all of these authoritarian leaders who might have trouble. So. What do you, I mean, again, understanding we can't get in Putin's head, but what do you think the picture of the world is that Putin sees? I would say that um, uh, here the, the main problem is that, uh, that Russia does not uh, allow democratic developments in its country. And uh, what we also see that, that they uh, disagree with uh, democratic uh, developments in their neighboring countries. And uh, this is the problem, uh, because uh, if uh, also, um, uh, for example, uh, if uh, Russia would uh, uh, withdraw from, from uh, Crimea or Donbas, uh, then, uh, from example, uh, from the European uh, side, we could lift all the sanctions that we have posed since uh, 2014. Um, I think that uh, if uh, Russia really uh, chooses uh, the uh, um, other ways, uh, uh, they would have been much more welcomed in the international community and uh, it um, would create uh, kind of normal interactions between our countries uh, uh, because uh, what uh, do we see at the moment? All the interactions are about uh, solving the problem. So, yeah. um, uh, so I think that uh, um, it would change the course if they would uh, change their policies. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, again, we have if uh, we, to assess the future, we have to look uh, uh, to the past. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, based on the facts in the past, we have not seen any positive um, uh, signs or, or any positive uh, uh, developments. Uh, so that it shows that we have to prepare for uh, have to be prepared for the worst uh, scenarios. I'm going to start weaving in some questions that we're getting, but I'll start with one and then kind of wrap some related questions in. Um, if Russia does uh, escalate militarily, invades Ukraine, um, what kind of response do you hope that you'll see from the United States in particular? Uh, from the uh, United States, uh, we hope uh, that uh, the United States uh, continues this leadership that we have seen over this last uh, uh, current crisis. And also, of course, uh, we hope that the sanctions that have been discussed, uh, uh, the United States would uh, um, uh, impose these uh, sanctions and um, uh, severe sanctions that would really uh, affect uh, Russia and would uh, stop 
uh, Russia. Yeah. And then in terms, so one of the other kind of, I think, deterrence that the United States has put out there, and this was in the document that was ultimately made public, was that if Russia invades, the United States would increase force posture in Europe. Um, what is it that you think Estonia would hope for? I mean, you know, think people have talked about certainly strengthening the eastern flank, but one option could be to make our, you know, enhanced forward presence in the Baltics permanent. Would that be something that Estonia and you think other Baltic states would advocate for? Within NATO, we have discussed this um, strengthening the eastern flank already before the current crisis. Yeah. And from our perspective, of course, it is very important that we continue with these discussions based on current assessment and also uh, speed up with the preparations and uh, with these um, uh, activities. Uh, from our perspective, yes, it would be good to see the uh, enhanced forward presence as a, as a permanent uh, uh, NATO mission in our region. Uh, and um, also, uh, we would, of course, uh, welcome the uh, uh, presence of, uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, in, in the Baltic region because the uh, presence of the United States in our region has a clear uh, political sign also for our people. Yeah. But, so there's a couple of questions on sanctions, but right before I do that, I also want to ask about um, kind of regional cooperation. And so we have seen some discussion certainly about how the Nordic governments are moving to deepen their cross-border collaboration against the backdrop of rising tensions with Russia. Um, how does Estonia view this? And, you know, what are the prospects that we would see even more Nordic-Baltic cooperation? Uh, this is a good question because really our regional cooperation is in a good shape and, uh, and there of course always there are opportunities to strengthen it. Uh, but uh, we have very good cooperation among with our uh, Nordic uh, uh, partners and it's been also good to see that both uh, Finland and Sweden uh, have, have uh, been participating in uh, NATO's uh, ministerial as uh, partner countries. It shows clearly that we have also uh, good uh, uh, defense cooperation. And of course, uh, with uh, uh, our Baltic neighbors and with Poland, we have uh, very close uh, uh, defense and security cooperation. Okay, so a couple of questions here from people who are tuning in virtually um, and a few on sanctions. So one question asks, how are Europeans thinking about potential sanctions on Russian oil and gas companies? And is it realistic given the high dependence on Russia for energy in some countries? Energy security has been a topic uh, which is discussed in Europe since uh, 2006. And of course, uh, we have prepared for different interruptions. Uh, and uh, we have clear understanding also that if there are interruptions, then uh, of course, uh, the cost of energy will uh, rise. Uh, um, and uh, our countries are of course uh, prepared for these kind of uh, developments. Uh, but uh, there is also general understanding that uh, uh, we have to, uh, for worst scenarios, we have to really uh, be ready of, uh, for severe sanctions so that they would really mean something. Yeah. And um, one along these, um, what spillover effects should Estonia be concerned about if sanctions were to be placed on Russia? I think that might be getting a little bit at some of the remarks in President Biden's speech last night, too, that if, we, if, if Russia invades and we do move forward with some fairly severe economic costs on Russia going after banks and other things, um, I think we would expect that Russia would look to retaliate in some way. And so, what, you know, what does the United States, but, but really the West and European countries, need to be prepared for? And how concerned are you about the risk of uh, kind of escalatory responses? This is, of course, um, uh, very difficult to assess um, all the uh, implications to our uh, uh, economy. Uh, but if we uh, uh, put in place uh, heavy economic sanctions, then of course it means that uh, our economy uh, will be affected in many ways, and especially as uh, um, Estonia is a country uh, uh, neighboring uh, the Russian Federation, uh, we have uh, uh, economic relations with, with Russia in, in uh, different sectors. Uh, at the same time, we already, uh, once we have uh, seen it already, um, how to reorganize uh, its economy, our, our economy, because after 2014, when uh, the EU also uh, put forward the sanctions, uh, then uh, uh, we uh, 
had to uh, reorganize our uh, export and uh, import uh, with Russia in, in quite many sectors. So we have uh, this experience with our, within our society already. Um, it is also difficult to talk the, uh, exactly in, in detail about um, all the uh, possible implications because from the EU side we don't want to speak publicly about the uh, sanctions in detail. So we have a question from Jemmy also uh, tuning in. So you, and I'm picking up on your comment that, you know, Estonia obviously has a lot of experience within your society in countering Russia and especially its hybrid kind of gray zone tactics. And Jemmy's asking, how can Estonia counter Russia's gray zone tactics? Are there efforts to build resiliency in Estonia so it is not susceptible to Russian gray zone tactics when they occur? And I guess I would take that one question further of really what should the United States be learning from Estonia, given the fact that you have had to live on the front lines for so long? Are there things that you um, think have been especially effective and that as the United States in particular could learn from? This is a good question. <laughs> um, what to learn from us? I think that one of the things that we really have to uh, uh, learn from history is that uh, you you cannot be naive when you uh, negotiate or discuss with, with the Russian Federation. Uh, and also you have to be uh, persistent in your demands. Yeah. And uh, I think that this um, uh, experience that we spoke uh, a bit earlier about our united approach, I think that it has worked out very efficiently. Uh, at the same time, of course, um, uh, Estonia, uh, for example, faced its uh, first ever uh, severe cyber attacks in 2007, which were clearly, uh, um, um, which clearly supported uh, uh, political uh, uh, demands. Mm -hmm. um, it is also another experience that we have really um, uh, shared with the world and, and hope that other countries have learned how to um, uh, tackle this kind of cyber attacks. And in Estonia, there is also NATO's Center of Excellence yeah. on Cyber Defense. This is the center where we directly share our experiences and also um, uh, prepare for uh, cyber attacks. And uh, from our perspective, it would be also good to have Ukraine as a member of uh, this uh, Center of Excellence so that also Ukraine could increase its um, resilience on, on, on uh, cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, another question coming in, which is one that was also on my list, is about the relationship between Russia and China. Um, so, you know, we, you know, uh, there's will be debate, I think, here in the United States about how we can appropriately balance um, our foreign policy in terms of dealing with two adversaries at the same time. But the reality is also that the relationship between Russia and China is deepening. And of course, Putin went to Beijing for the Olympics and they published that you know, quite remarkable manifesto um, outlining their alignment and shared interests and values. Um, how do you see that partnership? This is a very broad question. Uh, I mean, the question uh, about the relations between uh, uh, China and, and the Russian Federation. Uh, I think that they have, um, uh, in history, this relationship has uh, fluctuated. Some, sometimes it's a bit closer, sometimes it's less closer. Estonia was a member of the um, uh, United Nations Security Council for two years. We mm -hmm. just finished our membership at the council um, uh, in December. And we clearly saw that uh, they are, often they agree with each other, but uh, often they disagree with each other. So I think that uh, this um, uh, statement that was signed between uh, two countries uh, is of course important one. It, it shows um, uh, close cooperation between two uh, countries. But when we uh, speak about the geopolitics and, uh, and, and uh, security policy trends in the world, uh, I would say that this is not um, um, game changer in every areas. And, I mean, I know we're predominantly talking about Russia in this case, but can you, can you talk about how Estonia's kind of view and approach to China has evolved, um, particularly as we've seen such a Chinese aggression against your neighbor in Lithuania? Um, has that had an impact on how um, Estonia kind of thinks about its relationship with China? In Europe, uh, we see China as a partner, uh, as um, 
uh, and also as a um, uh, competitor and uh, as a uh, systematic rival. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is uh, the way how we um, uh, cooperate with China. So we have this kind of different, uh, the l different levels of, of our cooperation. Um, and uh, uh, from Estonia side also, we, we uh, uh, cooperate uh, with uh, China in many areas. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, we uh, showed us our full solidarity with uh, Lithuania uh, during this difficult time in uh, their relations with, with uh, China and uh, also uh, said it uh, to, to China that we disagree uh, with the approach that um, because of the political reasons, one country has uh, such a political and economic pressure. Okay, I'm going to go back to questions, so we're going to jump around a little bit. But there are a lot of questions on kind of economic repercussions of what uh, Russia is doing in Ukraine, I think, especially if we, the United States and Europe have to move forward with sanctions. So Amir Hassan Saeed asks, are there any economic repercussions that Estonia fears due to the rising tension in the region? And do you agree that Russia's neighbors are affected the most, the most negatively? Uh, here I would uh, first like to state that uh, at the moment in Estonia we do not uh, uh, feel any uh, direct military threat, so the situation in Estonia is uh, peaceful and, uh, and uh, secure. Uh, but of course we are worried about the security developments in the region which uh, would affect the whole security environment of, of Europe. When we talk uh, uh, more precisely about the sanctions, then uh, as I stated before, uh, of course, uh, we see that uh, uh, our country uh, will be affected if the sanctions uh, 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 will be adopted. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from our perspective, it is important to have strong and massive sanctions uh, so that they would really have this effect which we are uh, talking about, I mean, effect of deterrence. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, this is something that I had already asked, but I think it is definitely worth kind of drawing out and talking a little bit more. And so Vanessa asks, how can we start to think about, or how can we start to think of the transatlantic approach to Russia in a post-Ukraine world? I mean, it kind of gets back to, I think, again, regardless of what happens in Ukraine, um, it, you know, I, my, uh, I agree with Vanessa that we need a new transatlantic approach to Russia. And so what, what, what does that look like? And I know that you know, we haven't all gone through the process of thinking this through and we haven't had the transatlantic dialogue and discussions that would shape that. But you know, as you start to think about what a future approach to Russia is gonna require, um, you know, how, how, I don't know if you kind of out, get, just tell us a little bit of how, of, of how you would think about that. Um. I think that uh, at the moment, uh, of course, we have to continue with this united approach that we discussed so that uh, all um, NATO allies and also EU partners, uh, we have the same understanding. I think uh, that uh, this um, a clear example of this united approach was also the joint letter that we uh, sent uh, from the uh, uh, NATO and EU foreign ministers to right. uh, Minister Lavrov. I think that we must continue with this uh, approach. And at the same time, of course, we have to use the, uh, these uh, formats of dialogue uh, so that we could have dialogue with Russia and really uh, open these problems uh, and, and find step-by-step uh, -step solutions to these problems which have caused uh, this escalation in the uh, European security that we seen, have seen at the moment. And um, I think uh, we are going to face this uh, difficult period of time for uh, quite some time. Yeah. So we have to uh, be patient and, and really uh, use the, all, the possibility me all the possible means of uh, diplomacy to, to overcome this uh, crisis. Do you think that all European member states, EU member states, or and, and European countries are thinking along the same way? Um, and, and I guess what I mean by that is, do you think that, I mean, obviously 2014 was an important wake-up call um, and kind of, I think, really was a catalyst in kind of reshaping how the United States and European countries were thinking about Russia. It refocused our attention on Russia after, you know, a couple of decades of, of really kind of inattention and, and a lot of inaction. Do you think that this moment will have a similar effect? And, and I, so do you think that this view of 
that we're in for really a period of sustained confrontation with Russia is shared by most Europeans? Or do you worry that, you know, especially if we were to get through this through diplomatic means and avert the worst, um, that many European countries might be tempted to go back to kind of business as usual? It is a very difficult question, and let me make very a strong parallel here. Um, uh, uh, for example, the uh, uh, war in Syria, yeah. when it uh, uh, started uh, more than 10 years ago, it was on the table of every country. We were all very much concerned, and um, of course, the international community is still concerned. Uh, but uh, um, after 10 years, uh, that tension is uh, waving to another crisis, uh, and, and therefore, uh, this is the tendency that we have, unfortunately. Um, and so, of course, it can happen also with regard to uh, relations with, with uh, uh, Russia and uh, our attention towards uh, this uh, problem. Uh, so, um, uh, this is something that can happen in the future. I very much agree with this. But at the moment, I would say that all the uh, uh, EU partners uh, and NATO allies really understand the severeness of the problem. and, and and I have not seen any cracks in our uh, unity with this regard. Yeah, I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, I think this has been a really fantastic dis discussion. You know, as, as every, you know, as we're all watching this closely, it's been so hard to kind of gauge and understand and predict where this uh, conflict with Ukraine is likely to go. Um, but I think, you know, having your insights, obviously, from the front lines on living next to Russia has been ex extremely illuminating. And I, um, you know, I do again kind of share this view that with the aggression that we've seen, it is a it should be another wake up call. I mean, we've had you know 2008, we had 2014, and yet here we are again. And I do hope that this will be a catalyst for some like fresh thinking about what a new approach to Russia would look like or a re reinvigorated approach. And so we're really looking forward to continuing dialogue with European allies and partners about the way forward. And always, you know, appreciate your insights and all the lessons that Estonia has to share um, in terms of dealing with Russia and building resilience. So thank you so much for doing this and um, we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. Thank you, thank you very much for having me, thank you.